Hi there, welcome to another episode of Akiona Law, Family Law and Divorce Podcast. Here in this podcast, we talk about all things that intersect in the areas of family law and divorce. And today, my special guest is family law collaborative law attorney, Roy Martin, and he's joining us from Bellingham, Washington. Hi, Roy. Thanks for being on the show today. Hi, Lonnie. Thanks for having me. Very excited to have you on the show. We were talking beforehand how Roy is a very active member on our listserv. It's Domestic Relations Attorneys of Washington. And every time someone posts a question and he has an answer, he has the most insightful, thoughtful words of wisdom to, to share. And I always just feel like I learned so much from you whenever you share in the listserv. So, so thank you for that. First of all, that's very generous for you to for do that because I know it takes time. So, so thank, thank you. you for your generous and kind comment. So let's go ahead and get started because you've got a really interesting background. And I, you know, the, I, most people uh, like, you know, collaborative law, most people really don't know about it. But um, if you could just briefly, okay, so let's start off with this. You started off doing family law, you start off doing family law divorce litigation, Correct. and then you transition over to collaborative law. So I guess the first question I would want to know is like, what brought you into the area of being, of doing family law and divorce? Yeah, I, I went through a really um, horrible divorce during law school. And it was, it was um, in law school. When I was in law school. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Um, yeah. So it was first year um, and first semester finals. I got oh my gosh. on the first day of finals deliberately by, you know, my, my wife's attorney. And um, wait, wait, wait. So you were there sitting in class to take a final and you get served with divorce papers? No, no. He came to my apartment that morning. <laughs> oh, oh. oh <laughs> so anyhow, you know, I knew that it was done deliberately because this guy, you know, was that type of attorney. And I had an attorney who was totally different, who held my hand through the process, who guided me, who was kind. Um, and I saw both sides. I saw how how you could make somebody's life so much worse as an mm -hmm. attorney, but you could also make somebody's life so much better. And and something came into focus for me because I was really on a different path. I was, um, you know, I had a background in software, computer software and engineering, and I was thinking that I'd go into patent law, um, you know, because I had always, you know, worked with machines, not with people. Um, mm -hmm. And and I, I didn't think of myself as particularly good with people. I still don't. But what happened was I um, I I mean, I saw um, why certain fields are called professions that never made sense to me. My father was a teacher, but, you know, my mom would say, you know, your father's a professional and it never made sense to me. Like, so what? Like, it, you know, how is that different from any other job? Then I understood in that moment, like why doctors and lawyers and teachers and clergy are different because we have, you know, we have an, an opportunity, a possibility of impacting people's lives in really profound ways that matter. Not that other work doesn't matter. You know, like when I was briefly in the military, they used to say the most important job is the one that's not getting done. And that's true. Yeah. But, um, you know, like when I met, you know, when I was a software engineer and I wrote good code, I mean, that made a difference but not in the profound life-changing way that it does when one is an attorney or that it can when one is an attorney, if one, um, you know, tries to have that sort of impact. Okay. And just how did you do on your final, by the way? <laughs> well, I, I, wound up, <laughs> well <laughs> I wound up doing pretty well in law school. I think I did, what did I do that year? I think I, I think first semester I got three A's and a B. <laughs> Wow. I, I can't imagine getting served with divorce papers and then trying to focus on your final. Yeah. Yeah. I was, you know, I think being from a Jewish family kind of, you know, gave me a natural advantage. I'm sorry, I got to mute my phone. Um, you know, because, you know, particularly first semester, you know, when everybody's saying, you know, like, why, why are you hiding the ball? You know, like, you know, what, what are the answers to the questions? Those of us who grew up debating over the dinner table knew that there were no answers, that it was all, you know, we kind of got what the game was because it was already implicit in the culture we came from. So take us so okay, so you you went through this, like I still can't fathom the fact that you get served with divorce papers in your first year of law school and right before final. So that kind of shaped you into, hey, I wanna go into this field of family law. Well, it, it was more like I wanna make a profound difference in people's lives and this is a way I can do it. Oh, okay. And so then you started off doing divorce litigation. Correct. So what, and how long, how long did you do divorce litigation for? 
I did only divorce litigation for about four years. Um, and then I was, I really got fed up with it. I got to the point where it, there was one case in particular. I mean, pr I mean, for one thing, I mean, I discovered that it wasn't, that I carried a lot of stress, that it wasn't effortless for me to go to court the way it is for some people, because I really, I really wanted to impact the outcome maybe too much. And I carried, you know, it's like you only yeah. have so much power when you go to court, you have to kind of let go and just do the best oh. you can knowing that you could have always done better, but still it was, you know, the best you can, you could right. have done. Um, and I just felt like I was holding people's lives in my hands and I felt a responsibility that was overwhelming. Um, and that combined with the fact that I didn't, that I came to see over time that I wasn't seeing the whole picture, that I would get really wound up in these cases. And then a lot of times it became apparent later that I had only seen part of the picture. And it became particularly pronounced in one case where I, you know, won custody. I put it in quotes because, you know, what does it really mean? But I won custody for my client. Wait, really quickly, can, are you able to turn up your microphone volume just a little bit? I can maybe move my microphone closer. Oh, that's so much better. Yeah, I'm really interested in hearing the story. I want to make sure I hear you and the listeners hear you too. Yeah. So I was saying that um, I was, um, so I, I had won custody for, for this guy, um, you know, o over the, uh, over the objections of the wife and he and his girlfriend then went off to another city with the kids and the following summer they the kids came back to visit and um and then the the person who had been the custody evaluator contacted everyone and said she had met with the kids which i guess she had been scheduled to do and that she had, that something had changed in a really big way mm -hmm. these kids were claiming that they were being abused by and, who by the dad by the dad and the girlfriend. Oh, and, and the dad was your client? Yeah. yeah. And um, and I read what the kids had, um, well, what she said about what the kids had said. And um, one of the things they said was nobody was listening to them. And I realized that I was one of those nobodies who wasn't listening to them. Um, and I saw that I was, you know, like, I don't know if they were put up to it. I don't know what the truth is. But I realized that I was part of a system where there was, was no clarity where, you know, where it was easy to harm children without realizing you were doing it. Okay. And I, and I, you know, I just got to a point where it's like, I can't do this anymore. And I was getting myself retrained actually to be a, um, to be a, a, um, uh, what do you call, um, to go, to go into, uh, immigration law, to be an immigration attorney. Really? Immigration law? <laughs> yeah. Cause I felt, I felt like, you know, there I could make a positive impact. Okay. I could really help people. Um, cause I didn't know if I was helping or hurting. I mean, I knew that some of the time I was helping, but I didn't know if I was hurting just as much as I was helping. Um, and just then, um, a fellow walked into my office, another divorce attorney who had, for whatever reason, taken an interest in me, taken a liking to me. And he just, and I hardly knew him at the time. We became really good friends. He asked me, how are you doing? And I told him, I'm, you know, I'm going, I'm leaving divorce law. And I told him why. And he said, and he told me, well, you know, some of us are getting retrained to do this thing called collaborative law. Have you heard about it? Well, no, I haven't. Tell me. So he told me and he said, would you like to join us? And we were like the first attorneys in Arizona. I was that's where I was practicing at the time to get trained. I, I was I jumped at it. I was like, yes, that's exactly what I wanted to do when I got into family law. I, you know, I wanted mm -hmm. to have that sort of impact. So I'm right. interested. So we went off and got trained together and we came back and then and then tried to do collaborative law, but made a mess of it because we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> what are we, are we in the like 2010, 2000 and... 2001. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know collaborative law went back that far. Yeah, it actually goes back to the to the, to the 90s. Um, a fellow named Stu Webb in uh, Minnesota created it. Um, wow. He was a very experienced litigator, very well respected. And he just, he got to a point where he just said, we're not doing this the right way. And he, he reached out to some of his colleagues and proposed that they do things a little differently. Mm -hmm. And a few of them got on board. And they started pursuing cases in a different way. Um, and then eventually it spread. And then um, and then a group of attorneys, particularly female attorneys in California, not just attorneys, actually, attor you know, allied professionals, we call them, you know, some mental health professionals, financial professionals and attorneys. This very dynamic group of women got hold of it and completely transformed it, made it even better by bringing in other professions to, to oh. integrate. So now we have these integrated teams that work together. Because because when you're doing divorce, you're holding so much more than legal issues. You know, it's so wow. easy for attorneys to look at a case and say, you know, like easy case, you know, the, the property is simple, the, the maintenance is simple, the custody is simple. 
and you know, we lose sight of the fact that no divorce is simple, that for people going through it, it's incredibly complex and scary and challenging. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, having mental health professionals as part of a team makes a lot of sense. And having somebody to hold the financial pieces separately can make a lot of sense. So it sounds like you and this other attorney were almost at the forefront of the collaborative movement in Arizona. So yeah, 15 of us got trained. And I think uh, after we got trained, 12 of us actually started doing collaborative law. Mm -hmm. And then over time, other people joined and some people left. Okay. And so what did you find? So what did you find the difference between collaborative law and divorce litigation? Well, um, the reason I'm hesitating is because, you know, like I said, we didn't, you know, we didn't do it well at first and we had no teachers. Yeah. So we had to figure it out ourselves. So in the beginning, <laughs> it wasn't all that different. We were trying to make it different. Our intentions oh, were good, awesome. but we didn't, we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. But as I learned and, and slowly and over time, as we, we all really learned together, um, I mean, it was different in profound ways. I mean, I think that the central one is that the focus, well, first of all, by having an agreement that we're not going to go to court, it has okay. the effect of defanging the attorneys. So the clients have agreed to defang their attorneys and the attorneys have agreed to defang themselves. What that means is... I love that term, defang. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, because before that, if, it, you know, if my client called me up and said, you know, like, you know, my wife, she's not letting me ha see the children this weekend. You know, I would assume the worst and I'd call up the other attorney or I'd write a letter and I'd, and I'd you know, I'd make accusations. And in collaborative, I saw very quickly that you can't do that. I mean, I, I wish I had seen it quicker because like I said, we were doing veiled litigation at first, but it became obvious really quickly that when you don't have a lever of going to court, then you just get into a, you know, you, you, you get nowhere unless you work together. So I learned to get real curious, to, to call up the other attorney and say, okay, this is what I'm hearing from my client. I don't know what's true. You know, would you be willing to reach out to your client, you know, to engage them as my partner? Would you, right. you know, and to build trust that 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 collaborative is premised on very trusting relationships between the, the various professionals. You know, can you find out what happened? Uh, you know, I really want to know her perspective and, you know, and, and you know, we get to the bottom of it and we get a real solution much, much faster. Right. So, I mean, I think that's the heart of it is that by not being able to go to court, we have to work together. Um, in addition, you know, there's an agreement to fully disclose. Now, let's, then, let's, let's do this. Why don't, why don't you tell us what is collaborative divorce? Sure. And, and one more thing before I do that, which is that the core of it is really that we're focusing on, on intangible um, goals rather than, so, so, you know, it's really easy as an attorney to measure the things that can be measured, right? To, to, to focus on the things that can be measured because that, that's how we measure our progress. So even when you're talking about children, there's a tendency to measure how many days of parenting time, at, you know, as opposed to measuring the quality of parenting. So collaborative is very different because we don't measure the, ta I mean, we, we still measure the tangibles because those things have value. You know, we, you know, we have to help people get a portion of the retirement and I mean, all of those things matter, but not to the exclusion of things like goodwill, the, the reality that these people are going to be parenting their children together for the rest of their lives, hopefully. Goodwill. And so, and a lot of people want a divorce in a, in a way that's, you know, commensurate with their values. They, you know, they feel like, you know, we've loved each other through the marriage, at least as well as we knew how, and we want to keep doing that. We don't want to become enemies. You know, maybe they're, you know, they have attachments to each other's friends and family, and they don't want to lose those. Um, I mean, you know, children are typically at the core of it, though. Everyone wants to do right by their children. Um, and so, you know, people can still have differences. But we look at what's under those differences. Like if one person's saying, I need to have 50% parenting time, the question becomes why? Yeah. Why is that so important to you? As opposed to, you know, the what, which I was really good at as a litigator, you know, I'll try to get you what you tell me you want. Right. Now I ask, you know, why? What's underneath that? And if you find that somebody's afraid of losing connection with the kids or they're afraid that, you know, the wife and the kids will move away, you know, well, let's talk about that. Let's get to what it's really about. Um, you know, the same thing on the other side, if, if another, if the, if a parent says it's really important to me that I be the primary parent, you know, well, what's that about? Often there's fear, you know, fear that my spouse won't be able to parent the children as well as I do, or will hurt them in some way. So, you know, so how do we, you know, how do we deal with that? How do we address it? Not just, 
not just to emotionally assuage the concern, but to really get to the heart of it. So in a collaborative case, we don't just have attorneys. Um, we have a coach who's, who's a, a therapist, but they're not there to do therapy with the parties. They're uh -huh. there to help with the communication dynamic, help each of them look at what's, what's truly important, what will seem important 10 years from now, looking back on it, versus what might seem important in the heat of the moment. Um, and help us understand the dyna the communication dynamics so people don't continue to replicate it through the divorce as they typically do. You know what? You said something really interesting right there. You said, we with the therapist, we look at what's going to be important 10 years from now, what's important right now in the heat of the moment. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, in, in divorce, in divorce or custody battles or litigation, a lot of people are just focused on like right now, right now, not kind of thinking, well, 10 years ahead, is this really going to matter? Right, exactly. So, so helping people back up and look at the big picture. Um, and, and we start right, you know, we start with that at the very beginning. We start, you know, by asking them about, you know, what are, what are your reasons for wanting to do this collaboratively? Oh. And that's part of the first meeting. And we, we, you know, we get that down so that every time we go into a negotiation where we're trying to deal with the, the, the details, the nitty gritty, we remind them of what they told us. Because usually it'll be like, you know, we really want to do this right by the kids. We want to, you know, you know, each, each parent will say something like, you know, at the end of the day, I want us to be able to parent together. One, one woman said it very beautifully. I recently wrote about this. Um, it, was, it was actually um, not my client, but the other party, the wife. They had a 16 year old daughter and she said, um, you know, one day our daughter is going to get pregnant. You know, hopefully not anytime soon, but one day that'll <laughs> happen. And when right. that happens, I want you standing next to me in the hospital room, hospital, you know, maternity ward to greet our gra first grandchild together. Wow. Yeah. And it's, it was that kind of moment. It's like we all kind of got teary, like, like it was yeah. like a real privilege to be a part of this family, a family's, you know, journey at, at that moment. It was like, wow, to be able to witness that moment. It just made me so grateful that I get to do this kind of work. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. I'm just taking that in right now. <laughs> My goodness. So walk us through like, you know, a collaborative. Uh, so I guess basically what is collaborative law? What is a collaborative divorce process? Yeah. So there are two key elements. One is the agreement not to go to court. Mm -hmm. And the other is the agreement to fully disclose. We're not going to hide anything. Everything that's relevant to the well-being of the children, to the financial issues, you know, you know, money. So everyone's income, all the assets, everything's going to be out in the open. Um, Let me touch upon. So the two key things are an agreement not to go to court and agreement to fully disclose everything. So what happens if someone decides to go to court? That terminates the collaborative case. They have to start over again. All the professionals are out. All of our work product is out. So, so we're, you know, we're deliberately making it difficult and painful to do that. And, we, and we're very careful about selecting cases. In other words, I'm not going to do collaborative if somebody's got one foot in, one foot out. Okay. You know, it, it takes commitment to this process because it, just because we're doing it collaboratively doesn't make it easy. It's still a divorce. Right. And so you know, it's like I always tell people at that first meeting, we read the, the participation agreement out loud together. It's kind of like taking vows. And I, I'll say to people, you know, look, this is a hard process. It's not easy. Right. Um, when it gets hard, it's your commitment to this process is what's going to keep keep us going. So, I, you know, like I'm not setting off on this journey unless I have your word that you're committed to it and you're going to do the things you need to do. You're not going to tell me halfway through the case that I don't want to talk to the coach anymore or I'm not yeah. taking the kids to see the child specialist or, I'm, you know, like like you need to do the things that, are, you know, that are your part of this. Um, I'm, you know, because I can't be more committed to your case than you than you are. That won't work. Wow, that's powerful right there. Can't be more committed to this case than you are. Right. And so if the case were to go to court, you can no longer represent that person Correct. at all. Okay. And that rarely happens. I mean, I, you know, if it does happen, I see it as usually we, we failed to notice something that was important at the beginning because there were signs, there were warning signs. Okay. Um, I mean, it can, it can sneak up on you where you don't have really have any clue. So there, there's probably, I mean, you know, I would say that probably three to 5% of cases fail, something like that, a small percentage, but it happens. Yeah. And this is with a, you know, with a, with a seasoned team, with brand new collaborative attorneys like we were when I first got trained. I mean, the, you know, a lot of our cases failed back then, probably half. <laughs> 
But oh. I mean, we've gotten it down to, you know, to a science now. It'll still happen occasionally, but rarely. I'd like it. I'd like to get it so rare that it's like, you know, in the event of a water landing, you know, you know, you know, because you like, you, you know, you don't even listen to that when you're on the airplane. You, you know, you know, there's not going to be a water landing. Right. So, you know, it's like I'd like to get it to that point where it's just like like that. But we're not there. And I don't think we will be in my lifetime. But we do keep upping our game in terms of the product we deliver because we learn together and it's and it's a big box. There's always more to learn. What happens if someone fails to disclose everything? Well, if 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 assuming somebody finds out about it, right, if they yeah. do it and nobody ever finds out, it's just like litigation, right? It, right. It's, you know, but I mean, hopefully people who get into collaborative, um, I, I, I suppose, you know, I mean, one of the things I'm always on the lookout for actually is what are people's motives in getting into collaborative? Because if they're doing it to try to hide, you know, to, to try to pull the wool over someone's eyes, mm -hmm to try to, you know, if, ensure a certain outcome or prevent a certain outcome or um, or to exhaust the other party. I mean, all of those things are huge indicators that this is not appropriate and, and we're not going to do the case collaboratively. But if somebody manages to be such a good, such an effective sociopath that they, okay. you know, that they hide, you know, they can, they, that th the mask doesn't slip yeah. and I don't see it and nobody yeah. on the team sees it which I think is unlikely, quite frankly, because we get deep into people's lives. But if that were to happen, and you know, maybe it's happened in some of my cases, then of course we wouldn't know. Now, if I find out, which, which doesn't happen often, but it has happened from time to time, you know, then, so, so actually I'll give you an example from real life. A client tells me, he's been saying through, throughout the case, you know, like, I, I know she's having an affair. I know she, you know, he's saying all these things about his wife, like, I, like he knows them. And I, and, you know, as a professional team, because, you know, sometimes the, the, the professional team talks without the parties present, you know, we're talking about how certain he is about certain things and how puzzling it is. And at a certain point, he's saying this to me privately. And I said, well, listen, you don't know. You're, you know, you're making assumptions, but you don't know. And he's like, oh, I know. And somehow he said it in a way that pierced something for me. And wow. I said, OK, how do you know? Yeah. And he said, um, he said, well, you know, he, he was in law enforcement. He had access to information most of us don't. Ooh. He, he had his wife's, um, uh, he had access to her texts and her emails and he was reading all her stuff. And I said, well, yeah. And I said, well, okay, now that you've told me this, I'm glad you told me, but we've got a problem because, um, you know, I can't rat you out unless you give me permission to. Okay. But at the same time, if if you don't give me permission to, then the ca collaborative case will terminate. I will terminate it. Oh. I, I will withdraw, number one, um, because I can't represent you. But number two, um, I can I can terminate the case if I, you know, if just handing it off to another collaborative attorney means that you now get to perpetuate your fraud. So we've got a fraudulent collaborative case that shouldn't be proceeding collaboratively. I can just wow. terminate it. Wow. And so that's what I would do. So I said, what do you want to do? And he's, you know, and I, and I said, you know, I know it's a risk because he, you know, I said, you know, if she, if she gets upset enough and she goes to your supervisor, you may lose your job and, you know, your career and everything. So a lot's on the line here. And at the same time, she'd be killing the goose that's laying the golden eggs since your family is reliant on your income. So I don't know what the result will be. It's your choice. Why don't you think about it? Talk to people you trust, you know, give me a call back. And so he called me back the next day. He said, I thought about it and okay, I'm going to come clean. Okay. And so I called up the other attorney and I said, Hey, are you sitting down? No, should I be? Yeah. Yes. Sit down. <laughs> and I told him and he's like, Oh my God. I wow. know. <laughs> <laughs> like I never had that happen before. Wow. And, but we, you know, we had a meeting and, mm -hmm. and he, he told her okay. and, you know, he, he crawled across broken shards of glass to say he was sorry. Oh. And she was pissed. I mean, she, you know, she knew going in what he was going to say because the other attorney prepared her. That's yeah. part of what we do in a collaborative case is we get people prepared. But, you know, she expressed her outrage, but she wasn't entirely surprised. She kind of knew at some level. And, um, and, and she basically told him, it, you know, had better never happen again. And it, it actually, it wound up being kind of healing for them. Wow. We, we wound up, we completed the collaborative case and I think they got off on a better foot. I don't think they rebuilt the trust hundred percent by any means, but it's, it, it at least got something out in the open that had been hidden. And yeah. I don't think there were any more secrets after that. Wow. 
That's big. I'm glad everybody was able to come together and work through that in the collaborative process. Yeah, me too. I, I feel like in the divorce litigation, that would have just been this huge minefield. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would have just, I think it would have taken a lot to try and rein in, to try and tell someone, wait, 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 don't go to court about this. Let's still try and, let's try and work things out. Yeah, you'd be, you'd be surprised by how many people, you know, who come to me, they read my website and they'll say, you know, I was a child of divorce. I remember what it was like as a child and how horrible it was. And I don't want to do that to my kids. So I found you. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, I mean, that's one experience I haven't had. I've had my own divorce, but my parents didn't divorce. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, you know, I, I really appreciate those perspectives. It's another important piece. We, we don't just rely on what the parents say about the children. Okay. We have another mental health professional who, again, is not there to do therapy with the children, but rather that to get to know them, to get a sense of what their needs are, and to bring that back to the team. Because as adults, number one, we forget what it was like to be a kid. And parents don't, you know, like, they typically don't hear from their, their the children aren't able to articulate what their needs are. If yeah. a parent were to ask, which is not always a good idea anyway, children of a certain age are most likely to tell the parent exactly what they think that parent wants to hear. Right. Um, and so, you know, to have somebody who's, who's there to help the children have a voice in the process. Um, and not like a guard, not like a GAL, you know, not like not, not coming down from on high with, you know, here's what I see and this is what should happen, but rather here's what I see here. Here are my concerns. What do you guys want to do with it? And, you know, bring it back to us as a team, including, including the parties themselves, of course, but you know, all of us to help us look at, okay, you know, so we've got a problem and it can show up in, in really interesting ways. Like if, for instance, a, a child has discomfort around one of the parents, you know, mm -hmm. to bring that to us in a way that might al allow us to look at, okay, what do we do about that? How can we make it better? Yeah. And you're talking about the child coach? The, the child specialist is called. The child specialist. So why don't, why don't you, uh, you said there's several professionals involved in the collaborative law process. And who are those professionals that are involved? Okay, so you have- What are the roles they play? So a collaboratively trained attorney for each party. And, um, you know, and the, the better trained, the better. And I say that because, like I said, when I first started, you know, I just had a weekend's training and you don't learn enough. So hopefully if somebody is new to it, they either have a natural aptitude more than I did or they or they or they're coachable. If they're coachable, that's helpful. Um, and then we have a coach and, and we have a coach in every case. I won't do a collaborative case without a coach. Coach is really important. In fact, the coach is the glue that holds the case together okay. and and. Um, yeah, it's and that's for the, the husband and wife, right? That's the, the husband and wife, right? So that's a therapist who helps them have conversations with each other. And then, um, and then we have a, if there are children, I always want to have a child specialist. Okay. I didn't always feel that way, but I came to see the wisdom of it. I came to see that, you know, no matter how well the children seem to be doing, we don't mm. always know. It's always good to have somebody there at least to validate our thoughts, if nothing else, mm -hmm. as a kind of an insurance policy to make sure we're on the right path, that we're not overlooking something important. So the child specialist is there to meet the parents. And if the children are of an appropriate age to meet the children as well, to give the parents feedback as to the normal developmental needs of their children, which may be all they can do if the children are really young. Yeah. Um, but if the children are a little older and they can get to know them a little bit, also the unique individual needs of those children and help them to see you know, what the children are experiencing as the family goes through this process. Okay. And, I, and I like to have them present, even if all we're talking about are, is, is money. I, I didn't realize that until recently, but I found out that you know, having the child specialist present when we're talking about you know, spousal maintenance or division of property okay. can be powerful because it reminds people of what's really important to them. And it, it helps with that conversation. Okay. We can so, also... Oh, oh, go no, ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, we can have a financial neutral as well, so it's optional. Yeah. Um, the financial neutral is, is would you know would gather all the information, as opposed to having two attorneys both gathering it. We have one yeah. one neutral person who then writes a report with supporting documents and sends it out to the professional team first for us to review. The attorneys may ask questions, may say you know what about this, what about that. The report might get revised, maybe additional documents are gathered, 
But when we're all satisfied that we've got a complete picture, you know, th th that person will then disclose it to the parties okay. and say, you know, here, you know, do you see any anything we've missed? And um, and then we have um, and, and and the financial neutral can do a couple of other things. They can help, you know, because the, because their expertise is in money. They can help us look at how do we take this the finite resources of this, of this family, and and you know what are the different ways of putting it to work so that it works for everyone to achieve their high end goals, the goals that they started off with, mm -hmm. which you know can include things like I want to retire by the time I'm fifty, right? Okay. Or I want to I want to have a house, or I, you know I want to you know move to wherever, um, and then um, I want to go back to school. They can also help with someone who's you know financially disadvantaged, like if they if they're not sophisticated with money, to help mm -hmm. them begin to learn the ropes, to kind of coach them through, and possibly you know that can include looking at options for retraining, oh. you know, creating a career, um, doing right. it within within you know. Figuring, helping us figure out the, the maintenance, like how much maintenance and, yeah. you know, and for how long is necessary to accomplish these goals. Um, so they usually have a lot of expertise and creativity that the rest of us may not have. Yeah. I so love that financial neutral because it can help parties figure out long term, like you were saying, like, what do I need 20, 30 years from now to be okay? Whereas I feel like at just the divorce litigation level, when we're trying to talk about asset and division, all we can figure out is right now. We can't right. figure out what this means 20 years from now. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, it's been actually, it can be very powerful. I, there was one guy yeah. who used to put up um, a chart on the, on the wall during our meetings. He'd come to the, typically the second meeting, because the first meeting is where we create the collaborative container. So he'd come to the next meeting with all these projections. And yeah. he would say, if we stay, you know, if, you know, he'd like take a hypothetical. Like I put together this hypothetical and you know, you guys can accept it or reject it or whatever, it's up to you. But if we did this hy hypothetical, here's what I project your finances would look like for the rest of your lives. Yeah. And, and let's say there's a, there's a proposal for you know X dollars in spousal maintenance, right. which initially the payor goes, oh my God, I can't pay that. And the payee uh -huh. says, you know, well, whatever the payee says, but you know, and then you, know, and then you look at those projections and you see how, how things are gonna play out over time yeah. The person I would find that the person who had who was being asked to pay would go, oh, that doesn't actually look so bad, and I and I can see why it's important because if without that, you know, my spouse would be, you know, in in trouble. Right. So things can come into focus. Uh, I, I think it, it's so helpful to have people who are sitting in neutral chairs where they're you know they're not representing anyone, so it's clear they're just bringing information. They're not they don't have an axe to grind. They're not yeah. pushing for one outcome over another. It, it makes it much easier for people to take in information. Especially when it comes to financials. Yeah. Having that financial neutral there is just so helpful and illuminating. I want to ask you, I mean, let me ask you this. So when, if we're talking about spousal yeah. maintenance can and just, child can support. I just, can I just go ask ahead. Just children too. Having a neutral in that, in that role with children yeah. helps a lot with parenting plans, but, but go ahead. No, I love that. No, that's so important too. Thank you for saying that. So you, you had talked about when you're talking about monies, when you're talking about spousal maintenance and child support, you'd like to have the financial neutral in there. So would you have, if you're doing a conversation, right, a group meeting about child support and spousal maintenance, would you have the financial neutral, the child specialist and the coach there, all three of those people? You, I mean, you could. And, and okay. I, I mean, my preference would be, I mean, you're always trying to balance the resources of the family because having okay. everybody present costs more. I always want to have the coach present at any full team meetings. Okay. Um, and then um, if we're talking about finances, I certainly want to have the financial neutral if we, if we have one. And if we're talking about the children, I definitely want to have the, the child specialist present. Um, the question becomes, do we have the financial specialist present? I'm sorry, do we have, well, typically we wouldn't have necessarily have the financial specialist if all we're talking about is the parenting plan, because yeah. that's not enough value added. Yeah. But on the other, but I found that there is value added or there can be when you have the, the child specialist present for the financial discussions. Okay. Okay. So talk about you referenced that first meeting. You called it the collaborative container. Yeah. So yeah. So have, what is that? Yeah, we have a so after both parties have selected collaborative attorneys and they've retained us, um, you know, we'll set up a first meeting for which the coach may or may not be present. Some coaches like to be present for that first meeting, others don't feel it's necessary. Um, at that first meeting we'll we have a typical agenda. You know, we'll start by of course saying hello. 
and then we'll actually read through the collaborative participation agreement together. Now, we've already sent this off to the parties and they've read it and they've let us know if they have any questions and we've talked about it. But by reading it together out loud, it has the effect of number one, making sure everybody understands that, you know, this is real. We're serious about this. The, these agreements, you know, don't don't enter this. I always tell people, you know, litigation is awful in my opinion, but the only thing worse than litigation is litigation following a failed collaborative case. We don't Ooh. want that. Yeah. You know, you don't want to have spent, you know, ten or twenty or forty thousand dollars on a collaborative case and then have it, you know, go out the window and have to start over again in litigation. Yeah. So um so, you know, this is really important and we read through it together. We actually take turns reading paragraphs um, and make sure everybody understands all of it. And then, um, you know, and then we ask people, you know, are you like, you know, I'll typically when, when we used to do this in one room, I would look them in the eye and I'd say, I need to know that you're fully committed, that you're, you know, like it's like climbing a mountain. If I were going to climb a mountain with you, I'd want to know you're on the other end of the rope and that if I fall off this way, you're going to jump off that way, you know, and I can trust you. Um, right. It's the same thing, you know, or, you know, can I trust you because I don't want to have a failed collaborative case here. Um, you know, can your more important than can I trust you? Can your spouse trust you? Wow. And, you know, can your children trust you? Yeah. And and so, you know, people will typically say yes and they and they will typically mean it. Um, and we remind them of that if, if they start to wobble. Um, and I explain to them that part of that means working with the whole team, like not like like, you know, the people who think they can rewrite, you know, we, we do this a certain way because we've learned how to do this over years together, working together. You know, when people try to short circuit the process, it's kind of like, you know, if you're on a, on a commercial jetliner and you decide, oh, I, I know how to fly this plane. I'm just going to go storm the cockpit and kill the pilot and fly it myself. It's a good way to fly right into the side of a mountain. Oh. So, you know, like, don't do that. Like, be coachable and, and, you know, and, you know, keep, you know, letting us know, give us feedback as to how you're doing and how things are going by all means, but then, you know, allow us to help you. Um, Be coachable and allow the professionals to help you. Yeah. Yeah, that's important. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And if, and if something really isn't working for some reason, you know, we'll address it. If for some reason, you know, one, one of you can't work with, a, you know, with, a, with one of the professionals, well, we can substitute somebody else in if, necess if need be, but don't assume we don't need that professional. Right. Yeah. So the first meeting is would typically would typically take anywhere from one to two hours. No, no. The, well, the, the first meeting is always scheduled for three hours. The first half hour is just for the professionals, two okay. hours with the parties, and then a half an hour at the end debrief for the professionals. Okay. So that so that altogether it's three hours, and and you know I try as best I can to keep things like clockwork because after right. two hours people start to get exhausted. Yeah. The next thing we do in that meeting, which I think is really important, is we talk about what are called high level goals. So I always coach clients in advance what I mean when you I say that. You, I, I missed the first part. We always we ask them about their high end goals or high oh, level high goals. End goals. Got it. Because we're st sort of starting out up here in the clouds. Yeah. Like what what's really important to you? And then ultimately we have to get down into the weeds. Right. So, you know. What high end goals means, I always tell people is, you know, like, what are your visions for the future? What do you, you know, what, why do you want to do this case collaboratively? What do you see getting out of it? What do you want 10 years mm -hmm. from now for your family to look like? What, you know, what's in it for you to do a case this way as opposed to going to war? And, you know, here's where people will talk about things like, you know, that, you know, I mean, I've been talking about this stuff forever. You know, you're going to be going to the same weddings and graduations. But when mm -hmm. that, you know, raising the same grandchildren. But when that woman said, I, I want you next to me in the maternity ward when our first grandchild comes into the world, you know, she had done her homework because her attorney had coached her on, you know, I want you to think about this. I want you to spend some mm -hmm. time with it. And, and that came into her heart and she shared it and it was like really profound. So sometimes there are these moments, I mean, you know, typically people will talk about the children first and foremost, okay. but they can also talk about, you know, I, I you know, I, I don't want to spend a lot of money. I want this to be efficient that, you know, I, they'll talk about, I want to be in control. I don't want the court, a court to decide things for us that we should be deciding for ourselves. The, um, but they'll, they'll more often talk about things like the children. They'll talk about things like wanting to stay friends, wanting to honor the, you know, I was doing a case just the other day where um, one of the parties said, you know, I, I've always loved you and respected you and admired you, and I don't want to stop loving and respecting and admiring you. It's like, wow, another beautiful moment. Yeah. Wow, that's really sweet. Yeah, really sweet. 
Yeah, I, people don't always come into it like that. I mean, that was that was a little unusual. Mm. Um, usually, by the time people get to divorce, they're you know, it's like you have to help them get back to that place if you can. <laughs> but um, those high end goals, we write them down. We we well, first of all, we reflect them back. Like, did you know? So somebody will say X, Y, and Z, and what we we'll try to do is have the other attorney, at least in my cases, I'll have you know. So if 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 I'm representing the husband and the wife said that. Um, I'll, I'll reflect back what she said. I want to make sure I'm understanding what you said. Tell me if I get this right. And I'll reflect it back. And if she says, yes, you did, great. If she says, no, you didn't, okay, tell me what I got wrong. And we'll keep doing it until I get it right. And then the other attorney will do that for my client. Um, when, once we have it all down, after the meeting, there'll be what, are, what we call progress notes. One of the attorneys will write progress notes, send it to the other members of the professional team to make sure that Everyone who was at the meeting heard the same thing, or we got it all down on paper. We'll make any corrections. We'll get on the same page. And then once we think we got it right, we'll send it to the parties and say, did we get it right? Because they're, mm -hmm. they're not your progress notes until you both tell us they are. <laughs> so you can add to them. You can change them. You can subtract from them. We don't want to put words in your mouths. Um, but once they say, yes, you got it right, then we have, among other things, we have these really valuable high-end goals that we can keep bringing back to them they can change them. It's their right to change them through the end of the case and for the rest of their lives. But like when we're going into a meeting where we're going to discuss something challenging, particularly, but really anything at all, it's helpful to remind them of their high end goals. OK, we're going to have that conversation about maintenance today. I know it's really scary. Yeah. I know you're each scared about not having enough, being able to retire one day. You know, you know, it, it can feel oppressive. It can feel, you know, really, you know, dangerous. Um, so before we do that, let's review our high-end goals. Let's mm. talk about what you guys told us were important to you. You, you really want to both be there for your children. You want, to, you want to be in the maternity ward together when your first grandchild arrives. Okay. Now, now you know, I'll also remind people that in order to get there, you have to win. You can't just surrender you know, what you need because a win-win requires that you both win. So that, that doesn't mean you then let the other person win at your expense and you get run over. We don't do that either. It's like it's like we have to find a true win-win. The only real win is a win-win because otherwise there'll be resentment. And it won't work. It won't work for the family. So we need to find solutions that are going to work for both of you. And if there's pain, which there probably will be because most people aren't rich. I mean, yeah. occasionally you do a case where there's enough money where it doesn't really matter. You know, what we're debating is, you know, like if we're talking about money, it might be like, you know, who are the kids going to inherit a little bit more from one day? But, but in a typical case, you know, we're talking about hard stuff. And if there's pain, you know, how do we share the pain in a way that feels right to both, you know, to both of you, so yeah. that you can both say that felt fair, that felt, it felt just. So how long does the, how long does a collaborative process normally take? Six months, a year? It varies tremendously. Uh, it depends on how close people are to settlement when they show up and then how difficult they are or, or easy they are to coach through the process. Mm -hmm. um, I would, I've had cases that have settled rarely. I think it's happened to me like twice that a case is settled in, in like the first meeting, at, you know, after the initial meeting just to create the container. Um, wow. So, you know, so a two meeting total case. Um, usually it's three or four meetings, but a lot of stuff can happen between meetings because a lot of the work is done with the allied professionals or with the attorneys in the background, right? So um, I also had a case once where the parties decided to put everything on hold because their daughter was 16 and they wanted to wait until she graduated from high school before they finished the case. Okay. So we then backburnered it all. And it probably would have stayed backburnered even longer, except one of the attorneys was, you know, had gotten married and was moving out of state. So oh, we called geez. him up and said, you either have one, you know, one, you know, either you have to switch attorneys client of this attorney or else we need to get going so they decided to jump back in because that by that point the daughter had gone off to college it's like okay it's time let's let's do this wow that's something yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so it sounds like I'm, I'm just trying to think back when to when i was um when i did my collaborative case but there were no kids and actually what ended up happening was that the parties ended up reconciling so it really, we, we really didn't get that much long into the process, but are you, are you thinking, I'm thinking it almost sounds like anywhere from, I think if you don't have kids, maybe three or four meetings, you could get things resolved. Oh, I would, yeah, I would think, I mean, I, three or four meetings typically is enough with kids. Mm -hmm. So I would say two or three yeah. meetings without probably, 
but you know it depends every case is so different i've had cases yeah. that needed a lot more meetings it's it's really right. you know there's no one size fits all it's very unique to a family and um you know like you know like a reconciliation how rarely does that happen by the time people come to us but it does happen and collaborative can open the door to that because it remind it helps people remember that they love each other they care about each other and they might say well let's take another shot at this yeah so it's not it's not actually that uncommon like sometimes halfway through a collaborative case we'll hear you know put everything on pause we're going to try to reconcile and then they'll either eventually come back to us and say okay refund the trust balance we're done we're reconciling or they'll say okay it didn't work let's keep going okay so again in terms of the collaborative process just people when people sign the agreement they agree not to go to court um, they agree to disclose everything and I think that's a really big difference uh, aside from divorce litigation and then you have a team of professionals involved which is the collaborative attorneys the financial neutral the child specialist and the, and like the coach. coach the coach okay um what do you like best about doing collaborative law I love the camaraderie I love the you know the sense you know like when I first got into law here and there I'd meet a colleague at where it felt like you know we were kind of like we were kind of on the same team and we could do cases together effectively but so many people it felt like they were shooting at me it, it felt like you know it's like if you were a surgeon but they were and there were other surgeons but they were trying to kill you while you were doing your surgery <laughs> 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 What I like about collaborative is that we're really working together as a team and that the more we develop trust, the more we learn to trust each other. Like, like, in other words, I can't, I can't screw you in this case because it like, it might like somehow my client will benefit from it because we're going to have another case and another case after wow. that. Um, and, and not only, I mean, number one, that would totally, you know, work against the, the collaborative spirit. It would be completely hypocritical, but, oh. but we just don't think in those terms. We think, in, you know, we learn to become um, partners. And if something isn't working and we're, and we're coming up against each other, we have to work through it, which might mean, you know, let me take you to lunch. Let's talk about what happened. You know, let's, you know, I, I need to understand your perspective. I want you to understand mine. Um, if we, you know, if we need help, we might bring in somebody to help us. Maybe ask one of the coaches to come help facilitate that discussion. It doesn't happen very often anymore, but it can happen. I mean, I, you know, every now and again, I mean, um, well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, you know, Inevitably, between human beings, things come up. I think we get skilled at working through them, but every okay. once in a while, we get hooked in a way where it's where we can't. Our skills aren't enough to get us to get us through whatever came up. Because you know, one of the reasons we do a debrief after each meeting yeah. is to have those discussions. You know, not to let things fester. So right after a meeting, even if everything seems to have gone really well, you know, I might say, "Ah, oh, it it's so nice working with you guys. This has been great." Now tell me, you know, did I step on anyone's toes? Wow, right, the debrief. You know, and if I did, please, you know, please give it to me straight because I want to understand. Mm -hmm. And if somebody says you did, I'll, I'll, I'll ask them to be very specific because okay. it's like, you know, if you just said, you know, you, you weren't listening to me, well, I, I don't really know what to do with that. You know, but if you can tell me when I wasn't listening to you, what happened, what, what, who said what, so I can think back on it and go, okay, now, now I see. So you have a particular need and I, you know, I missed it. Right, and, and but, I, but as I. But as I get to know you better now, I'll know that if that comes up again, you know, to, to know that, you know, this this particular professional handles this kind of thing in this way. And, you know, we'll try to tailor our approaches so they harmonize. And so you're talking about the debrief with the professionals after the right. initial meeting. Now, are you only taking cases? With, you're with every meeting. Go ahead. After every meeting, not just the initial yeah, meeting. Yeah. And yeah, you're uh, so are you do you so you're in Whatcom County, right? Mm hmm. But do you take collaborative cases throughout like King County and I can I can take them anywhere in the state. I mean, the people that I know best, the, the attorneys and other professionals with whom I have the closest relationships are the okay. ones who are part of the Whatcom Collaborative Group. Some of them are actually from King County or right. Snohomish County. I mean, they, they're not all necessarily here in Bellingham. But um, but I, I, you know, I've done cases with other attorneys in other parts of the state. And, you know, some of them are just, you know, such a pleasure to work with. I mean, I, I think everyone is when you get to know them, but, you know, just, you know, certain ones, you know, certain people have worked so hard to hone their skills that I, you know, that I sort of, I'm eager to work with them. And, you know, like we'll, we'll, we'll meet at a statewide meeting once a year. So kind of like DRAW has a statewide meeting, CPW, Collaborative Professionals of Washington has a statewide meeting. And I try never to miss it since, since COVID came, I've missed it. <laughs> but before COVID, I'd gone every year straight for 10 years or whatever. Wow. Um, 
and I meet these people from all over the state and, you know, we'll connect and I'll be like, oh man, I hope one day we get to have a case together. That would be so awesome. And how long have you been doing collaborative law? Well, I've been an attorney since 1996 now, and I got Ooh. trained in collaborative in 2001. So what is that, 21 years? Well, wow, that's, that's a long time. you got to look very young for your many years of practice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can you, you get... I don't know how old you are, but you look young. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got more gray hair than you, so that's what I'm going off of. <laughs> so uh, I know people are going to, I know people are going to want to know this question. They're want they're going to want to know what's the cost. Can you give us a ballpark figure of how much a collaborative divorce costs? It, it's hard. I, I never sell it to people as a low cost alternative to yeah. litigation. What I sell, what I tell them is, look, I think you can get better bang for your buck if, assuming it's, we're choosing the case yeah. wisely. Not if yeah. not if it's a case that isn't appropriate to collaborative. In which case, it would be better to litigate. Um, it, it can be important to litigate. But if we if we're taking a, a situation where you know. A, and I would say at least half of the cases that, that go to, you know, that go through the litigation process probably could be collaborative. Um, and so, you know, it just depends on how much support a family needs through the process. I would say the low end is probably something like, you know, both parties. So I'll talk about it as combined as a family, you know, like in other words, let's say each party spends, you know, 3000 on their attorneys and another you know, thousand on allied professionals. We've just done a seven thousand dollar collaborative case. That's that's going to probably be roughly the low end. Oh, that is low. Yeah, the high end is you know is probably well. So a typical case is probably more like I don't know ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars each for attorneys, and you know several thousand for each professional, other professional. Um, so you know something in the I don't know. I, Actually, that's probably there are some, I don't know, it's, it's hard to categorize. I'd probably say, let's say 12 to 30,000 is the middle range. Middle range. Yeah. Per and person. No, well, no, total, family. Oh, you mean total? Oh, no, I'm sorry, per, per person. You're right, because I said, no, no, actually, I well, it's a continuum. So really, oh, it's, wow. really, it's hard to speak of. So yeah, I mean, if you think 7,000 is the low end, and then I'm so if, depending on what you call the middle, I'm saying like, you know, let's define 12 as 30 as the to, to 30 as the middle where most people, you know, the hump of the bell curve is going to be. You know, and that's no different than litigation. You can, you know, each person can spend at that temporary orders hearing anywhere from 10 to $15,000, depending yeah. on how, you know, you're talking about parenting plan, child support, yeah. spousal maintenance. Litigation is not cheap. Right. You yeah. Know, and, and what I'll tell people is that assuming your case settles, it won't be as expensive as the most horrible litigation cases. In other words, a, a typical litigation case will settle somewhere in that range. But if you have a really bad one, you might be spending $100,000 or more. Collaborative, you know, it, you, it would be very rare, at least in my community, to get to anything close to that before the case either settles or fails. Right. And I just think you get, you know, it's just so much more rewarding through that collaborative process because you're having a direct say. And not only that, you just have that team helping you with the, you like you're saying, the child specialist, the parent, the coach and the financial neutral. Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing that helps people relax is to know that nothing is going to be done without your consent. Nothing's mm. going to get forced down your throat. At the mm. end of the day, nothing's going to happen unless you agree to it. Yeah, nothing's and that's really going to happen unless you agree to it. Wow, that's that's a huge piece right there. Yeah. <laughs> nothing can happen unless you agree to it. Unlike court. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and, and even if a case settles in court, because, you know, most of my cases settled when I was litigating, as, as do I'm, I'm sure that's true for most everyone. I mean, nobody right. nobody tries all their cases. I mean, if you try one case a year, that that can be a lot. But but um, the thing is that when you're litigating, they set they settle in what, what I call the shadow of the court. In other words, either some mediator who doesn't let you actually talk to each other, but keeps you in separate rooms, you know, uses right. fear and intimidation to tell you this is what's going to happen if you go to court. So you oh, better agree to it. Or your own attorney tells you that, right? So you get you either, no matter where it comes from, you feel like you got pushed into something. And yeah. and what's ironic is that both people will come out of that feeling like they got hosed. You know, and it's like, you know, you'd think if one felt like, you know, they got hosed and the other person must feel like, oh, I won. But that's rare. Usually both people feel like they lost. It, you know, and, and doing litigation, I mean, one of the things that it taught me is that the only true win is a win-win. Because when you win, you know, those, those occasions, you have as a litigation attorney where you come out of court going woohoo i rock you know and it feels good for about 20 minutes because you know like you quote unquote won for your client it starts to ring hollow really quickly as you see yeah. the resentment as you see the damage that was done as you see 
how long term it doesn't work. So that, you know, to get to a true win, both parties have to feel like they have ownership over whatever was agreed upon. Right, right. I wish uh, I wish the collaborative process was utilized more here in our state, but, you know, slowly but surely, I feel as Happening. if we're getting... You know, when I first got into it um, in 2001, I mean, nobody knew what a collaborative attorney was. My own law partner, I came back from this training uh -huh. and, and I told her what I had done. I was so, you know, psyched and she looks at me and she's like this really good person, really fine litigator, but, you know, like... a woman with a beautiful heart and she just looks at me and she laughs and she says you know do you want to be a lawyer or, or don't you you know she said if you want to be a social worker you know you can go back to school for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like you really don't get it you know and she didn't you know she would make fun of it um, and I started doing it struggling with it at first but I stuck with it thank god I stuck with it because a lot of people dropped out saying you know this doesn't work but it wasn't that it doesn't work oh. it's that we didn't know how to work it yeah. we didn't you know we we you know, so those of us who hung in there and, and eventually learned how to do it and got good at it, um, you know, got to have, and, and now it's much easier because there are many, many mentors. But back then, you know, was I going to call Stu Webb in Minnesota? I actually did once or twice and he was very nice wow. and spoke to me. But, <laughs> but I mean, I didn't have anybody local to guide me through the process or to be my partner in a case. Um, you know, we would, you know, we would have these ridiculous discussions where it'd be like, you know, you need to look in the mirror. No, you need to look in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, so t anyhow, to get to this place where practice is so gratifying and where I feel like I'm really mm -hmm. helping people and, um, and where I get that kind of feedback from folks, which feels so good. Um, it, you know, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of effort, but it's, um, I mean, it was so worth it. And I'm, I'm just really grateful for having, you know, been invited to train with that initial group of people. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds just so exciting. So, oh, so what, what I was going to say, though, is that the, the, yeah. the that I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. So oh, what no. happens when, you know, that shows you I've been practicing a long time. I'm old. Uh, <laughs> what I wanted to say is that um, it, it's gotten um, I mean, the quality of what we do in collaborative law has gotten better and better over the years. And it's gotten much, much. It's much more out there now. I mean, it used to be when when, when I first started, there were there were attorneys who were like, you know, that shouldn't be ethical. You shouldn't be able to do that. Um, and they tried to get state bars to shut us down. Really? And, yeah, absolutely. In fact, it even happened in Colorado for a number of years. Wow. Um, you know, you know, over time, it became a respected part of of the domestic relations community. And, wow. and and I think more and more so over time, there are, you know, probably a few old timers who still go, I don't I don't get it. I don't believe in it or whatever. But I mean, I think the younger attorneys, I mean, you know, actually, it was funny because early on, I was um, I had gone to the University of Arizona Law School, and that's why I was in Tucson practicing, raising my kids. And um, and I was invited to debate about collaborative law in front of a family law class. And so the professor invited me and this guy, David, Lieber David Lieberthal, who was one of the real big time litigators in Arizona at the time. Okay. He was like, you know, one of these guys who, you know, charged more than everyone else and, you know, AML and all that. And, um, you know, tremendous expertise as a law student. I used to when I heard he was doing a cross exam and I used to go watch him because he was so good at it. So I really yeah. respected this guy. So the idea of debating him was scary to me. But I talked to this, you know, the, the guy I mentioned who invited me into this, he became a mentor. And I okay. went to him, I said, Peter, you know, what do I do? I'm being asked to debate, you know, David Lieberthal. That's kind of scary. And, and he kind of coached me a little bit. He said, well, you know, he said, just, you know, like, let's talk about, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of collaborative and just be honest about it. And so when I went in there, you know, the first thing David Lieberthal said was, you know, this should be unethical. He shouldn't be allowed to do what he's doing because, he, you know, when I go into a case, I tell my clients I'm there with them till the end, no matter what, unless they fire me. Whereas, you know, whereas, you know, he's saying I'm only going to be there with you if, if this works out. If not, I'm going to abandon you. Yeah. And, I, and I, you know, and I listened to him and I. And when it was my turn to talk, I said, well, you know, Mr. Lieberthal is right, you know, he, uh, in, in a sense. I mean, he's right that I'm not necessarily there to the end if the case fails. Um, that is, you know, the risk of collaborative. But, you know, you can't just weigh the risk of collaborative in a vacuum. You know, you have to weigh that against the risk of litigation. So the risks of collaborative are, you know, if, if we don't get to the end, the case fails, they have to start over again in the litigation. And that's horrible with new attorneys, new professionals. But, um, you know, the, the risks of litigation, what are they? You know, I mean, I've seen people destroy their children emotionally fighting over the children's well-being, ironically enough. I've yeah. seen people bankrupt themselves fighting over money. Yeah. You know, it's, you know it's, it's really typical for there to be such profound harm that children 
you know, talking about it 20 years later in therapy mm -hmm. and the parents don't even know sometimes. Oh. I mean, there's so much harm that comes out of litigation, plus the cost and the, you know, the, the you know, and, and the effect on other relationships, on communities, because, you know, a family, a divorcing family is not just a family. There are all these people around them. And I, I laid out probably better than that I'm doing now because, I, you know, I was prepared for it. So, you yeah. know, I laid out all these costs and I said, OK, so if you put them on a scale, you've got the, you know, the risks of litigation on this side and the risks of, of, of collaborative over here, you know, which one seems heavier to you? And the law students totally got it. And, and when that happened, when the law students clearly got it, I oh. knew that in time, you know, over time, collaborative was going to become a thing that it was going to, that it was going to grow and it was going to become respectable and that it was going to be, you know, not just respectable, but it will, you know, people would see the wisdom of it. And sure enough, that's what's happened. I mean, wow. you know, when I meet young attorneys, uh, you know, who, for whatever reason, are going into family law, um, you know, if we talk about collaborative, they're generally open and interested. No, that's a good point. I remember when I, I think when I became collabor collaboratively trained back maybe in the early 2010s, 11, 12s, that it just seemed so, it didn't seem where it was, where it is now, where it is just so much more respected and just natural. Yeah. Can I ask you, Lonnie, do you, so you litigate, you don't do collaborative cases? No, I mostly litigate because unfortunately in Snohomish County, no one has really approached me for collaborative law, except for one time. So I'm a little bit bummed about that. <laughs> Well, can, can I, is it okay if I coach you a little bit? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, no, I mean, like, no one's approached me to do a collaborative law case, except yeah, for no, just no. Well, so for years, nobody approached me to do a collaborative law case. It doesn't work that way. Oh, here's, okay. Here's, here's how it works. People come to me and they'll say, I, 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 you know, I need a divorce. Can you help yeah. me? And I'll say, okay, let's talk about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> tell me a little bit about your case. And if it seems appropriate, I'll say, you know, well, there are these different options, you know, like, so when I used to do both, because for years I did both litigation and collaborative. I mean, now I'll just, you know, it's on my website and everything. And I'll say, I don't litigate. Yeah. So let's talk about your case so we can see if I'm the right fit or if I might be the right fit. Otherwise, I don't want to even consult with you because I don't want to take your money and for you to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. But back when I did both, I would say, you know, let's let's look at the options and I'd lay out, you know, here's what collaborative is here. Here are the benefits of collaborative. Here are the challenges of collaborative. Here are the benefits of litigation. Here are the challenges of litigation. Yeah. What what makes sense to you? Now, very often they would they would say, oh, I get it. This makes sense. But how do I get my spouse on board? And, and sometimes that would be a problem. Um, one of the things I began doing at that point was I would if before a consultation, if somebody just reached out to me and said, I want to consult with you, I'd say, OK, that's one option. Or I can do a meeting with both of you where I, well, I'm not going to give anyone legal advice. It's just an informational meeting about the, the different ways to divorce. And if we do that, I can do it with both of you together. And then after that, I can consult with one of you or the other, but not both. And I would have them sign an agreement saying they understood what I was saying and that, wow. they, you know, because <laughs> I didn't want, you know, anybody to claim later that I had consulted with both of them and then I yeah. became one party's attorney. Um, so, I mean, I still have that agreement. If anybody wants it, I'm happy to share it because uh, that oh. is one one way to get your name out there is to, you know, be the, the person who gives, you know, people information. I, I You know, I would charge them. I would I would do a two hour long meeting because that's how long it took to fully lay out the ins and outs of all the different approaches, everything from sit sitting down across the kitchen table you know, mediate the different types and styles of mediation, collaborative and in, in, in all its complexity and litigation. I'd explain all four of them. Oh. So I wanted them to come out with a really thorough understanding of each of the approaches and when they make sense, because all of them make sense for certain kinds of cases. I would want somebody to know, if, you know, if they went home and they were being, you know, they, they were facing domestic violence, that they didn't yeah. call me back and say, you know, let's do a collaborative case. They would say, you know, this is the kind of case for which litigation is appropriate. So let me let me get somebody who can help me. Um, but, um, and that was effective for a long time. I, I think when I stopped doing litigation, I found that those kinds of meetings became less necessary. I would just, I put it all out on my website. And then I, um, when people call me now, I just tell them what I do and what I don't do. And we talk about it and, you know, and sometimes I'll say, you know, you might consider, I, you know, I don't want you to be disappointed leaving a meeting with me, but you might consider meeting with two kinds of attorneys, you know, do a consultation with somebody like me, collaborative mm -hmm. attorney and do a consultation with somebody who litigates because you'll get different perspectives and then you can decide, you know, which, which sounds like the right one for your situation. Wow. That's, that's so appropriate because <laughs> it, 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 such different perspectives from a litigation standpoint and the collaborative standpoint. Um, so what, what else do you do just collaborative law or do you mediations too? I, you know, I, I used to do 
a lot of mediation and a lot of collaborative and I and I yeah. also do what you know unbundled services where people come to me you know somebody would come to me and say I've already got it figured out can you help me you know write it out so we'd start with a consultation make sure they really have a solid agreement if they do so I still do that I still do the unbundled I do some mediation but not much because I find that mediation doesn't even start to hold a candle to what I can deliver as a collaborative attorney mm -hmm. when I do mediation I do I do a kind of collaborative mediation so I will send them off to collaborative attorneys, both of them, people oh. I trust, you know, to, to give them good solid legal advice without creating a fight and who can support them through the mediation process. I also represent people in mediation when somebody else is mediating. So I'm one of the, the attorneys either in the background or present at the mediation sessions. Oh, okay. That, that, can, that can be powerful. I think that, you know, if, if I were ranking in terms of how much support people need to, to keep, to stay out of court, you know, they're, the people who can do it on their own come up with agreements on their own and maybe just need some legal advice and help preparing documents. They're kind of amazing. Yeah. I marvel at, at those people. Those are the people who need the least support. People who can, you know, who can do a mediation session with the kind of mediator who lets them be in, in the same room and tries to facilitate healthy discussions or has more of a therapeutic approach where they're trying to help them really understand each other and, and um, you know, empathize with each other. Right, right. You know, that's a little bit more support and some people can do that. Some people kind of need their attorneys there to help them with that. And if they're collaborative attorneys, we can help with that kind of process okay. as opposed to the litigation style medi mediation, which is really more akin to court where you're, you're negotiating in the shadow of the court. So what I'm talking about now is staying outside the shadow of the okay. court, helping people come to true win win agreements that are, you know, where, you know, they know what the, a court might do. They, you know, in other words, as an attorney, I still let people know, you know, here's my opinion as to what the range is on what a court could potentially do, which is a broad range, but but you know they might choose to do something different because they you know because they're not they're not really focusing on that they're focusing on the needs of their own family um, okay. so then you know the folks who need to have attorneys present with them that's an additional layer of support and containment okay. if we have a, a mediator who's also a collaboratively trained attorney who does is really good at both mediating and then we have two collaboratively trained attorneys around them we've got a lot of support in place okay. um, if you want to have the full meal deal you know, then it's great to have two collaboratively trained attorneys, a coach, a child specialist, a financial neutral. You know, oh. now, now we've got a lot of support around this family. And and Rory, how can people get a hold of you? They need to contact you for for services. Oh, okay. Well, my there's my phone number, which is three six zero seven four six zero four zero zero. My web my website um, is uh, creativedivorce.com. And if they want to email me, they can email me Roy Martin at creativedivorce.com. Okay. Creativedivorce.com. I love that. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Roy. And thank you for sharing your thoughts um, and your wisdom about collaborative law. Um, learned so much from you today. Do you have any final last words about why people should choose to use a collaborative process or what they can, what they can stand to gain from it? First, let me just say thanks so much for doing this, Lonnie. I know, I know you spend a lot of time um, creating these, these, um, these podcasts and uh, you know hopefully people get a lot of value from them so it's a real kindness that you do this i hope so too and i appreciate it um you know i mean I, I would say that you know if you know to me litigation is now like the hospital emergency room i'm I, i'm i'm grateful that there are that i have colleagues who are willing to litigate because i don't want to do it and there are cases that need to be litigated yeah. those are the cases where there's you know where where one party's hiding assets hiding income running up debts committing acts of domestic violence, harming the children, those sorts of things. Those cases need to be litigated. Um, if you, you know, if, if you're in a situation where there's a possibility you may be able to work together, then I would say get come to come to people like me to the collaborative community sooner rather than later. Don't wait, because what happens is, you know, the fear can build and fear feeds on itself and the containment starts to break down. So by so if both spouses talk to a collaborative attorney early in the process, that in and of itself will create more containment. You may be able to sit down then and negotiate a settlement that you couldn't do before because you've both gotten legal advice from somebody who understands conflict resolution. Or if you need more help, you have you have you now know what the options are. So you can bring in that additional support mm -hmm. that can be a full collaborative case. It can be, you know, it can be a, a form of mediation. It can be, you know, it can be lots of different things. But you know, by talking to the people who who do this work, the peacemaking work, the, so you know, the collaborative 
professionals, whether they be collaborative attorneys or collaborative, um, you know, therapists, right. um, you know, we can we can help you to figure out how to dissolve your marriage in a healthy way. So, yeah, um, so come come sooner rather than later. Come sooner rather than later for um, for conflict resolution help. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you so much again, Roy. And again, if you need to get a hold of Roy, you can contact him at creativedivorce.com, his website. And thank you again all out there for listening to another episode of the Akiona Law podcast, wherein we talk about all things that intersect in the areas of family law and divorce. I'm Lonnie Akiona. Lonnie Akiona. Until then, uh, stay safe and healthy. The information in this podcast is general advice only and should not in any respect be relied on as specific legal advice.